All right, welcome back to the Morning Show, right here on the Rajas News Channel. We've got Michael Wilson for a Global Business Update. Great to have you, Michael Wilson, from London. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, yeah, so basically what's happening as far as the Asia-Pacific markets are concerned is they're still digesting that fairly hawkish note from the Fed on Wednesday, not just an interest rate rise, but maybe the, the prospect of a lot more, and, and particularly Jerome Powell saying that it was actually it's actually going to be a painful process. He actually said that, and I think that's probably um, got a lot of investors worried. Hong Kong down a bit too, Sheng, Sheng Zeng, uh down about one and three quarters, the whole of the index down about for the for that particular region down about one and a half percent inflation in malaysia coming in line with expectations but singapore's inflation slightly higher than expected um the chinese e-commerce giant alibaba is going to uh, invest a billion dollars over the next three fiscal years to support its cloud computing um, the investment consists of what it describes as financial and non-financial incentives such as funding, rebates and go-to-market initiatives. Um, it's not an enormous part of their particular setup, but they do see themselves um, rivaling um, and they are behind Microsoft and Amazon in this. So they, they would like to get higher than that. Um, China's economy, we get these little glimpses of what's actually happening. According to Trip.com, um, hotel bookings are up um, in China. Um, they're around about pre-pandemic levels. These are domestic hotel bookings. So what it's meaning is, is that the populace is actually moving around um, within within China um, itself. Um, the, the, not as much revenue as the hotel owners would actually like, but these, these figures are definitely on the mend. So let us refer to the United States. Then futures pretty flat as far as uh, another day of losses is concerned. I suspect that's probably what it's going to be. NASDAQ up 10 points, Dow up by 41 points in futures. Um, an interesting um, little sna snapshot from Costco. Costco, the one of the world's, I think it's probably one of the world's biggest um, discount retailers, um, stock down about 2.6%, although revenues are up. It actually was pointing towards higher freight and uh, labour costs. And just some breaking news that the SEC in the United States has penalised Boeing $200 million, putting, as they put it, profits over safety about the 737 MAX crashes, the two of them, and a former Chief Executive there, uh, Dennis Muckenberg, will personally pay $1 million towards that particular fund. The IEA is saying that the energy crunch will break Eurozone unity. Let's hope not. There he is, IEA boss Fatih Birol. Um, he's talking about a scramble for energy security, what he described as a, a wild west scenario. And if this happens, it'll dent the EU's uh, weight across the world. Very much um, hope that he's wrong as far as that's concerned but to add to his case um, we're already seeing a contrast between what states are actually wanting to do Poland and the Baltic states are looking for tougher sanctions as far as Russia's concerned Hungary says no and remember as far as the EU is concerned any changes have to be uh, have to be agreed by all the states so there's still a bit of division there. The big one today is the so-called mini budget. It's not so mini. Um, it, it will be quite huge, I would imagine. Kwasi Kwarteng um, will reveal his plans to kickstart the UK economy. He's already fired a, a, cross, a, a shot across the bows of the Bank of England, which, as you know, increased interest rates by a conservative half a percent. Uh, not my words, this is what the market said, conservative half a percent yesterday. Um, all sorts of tax cuts um, actually anticipated, including we know that the corporation tax increase is going to be reversed. National insurance may well be cut. Um, he's going to introduce 38 special areas which will have lower business rates and lower regulations to try to, um, to, try to get some kind of... Um, get some kind of business development actually going. Bank of England yesterday, as I said, up by half a percent, seventh time in inflation, though 9.9 percent. .9 and uh, the world markets are counting UK debt as getting more and more expensive. And finally, um, as far as commodities are concerned, concentrate on oil, still relatively volatile. Um, the grappling, on the one hand, there's this 
lack of demand or the de deteriorating demand outlook and it's still um it's still subject to shortages and and so on so supply risks and tight market conditions um we could see oil sort of getting above well above the 80 dollars a barrel level um, but a quick tumble as far as the global recession is concerned will keep prices um will keep prices relatively contained within the sort of range that they are now but it is in, intensely volatile and probably even though i do it every day um, probably not um very conducive to understanding what's going on in the world on a day-to-day -day basis that's the global view all right uh, thanks so much michael Real quickly, a lot of people are quite very ambivalent about this new mini budget by Kwasi Kwarteng. In fact, the markets are uneasy, the guys at the city are uneasy about it. Is this not just in the bead? So let me explain this way, Michael. For, for those that have got blood pressure issue, you want to get your blood pressure down, but you have to get it down systematically. So this is just like taking overdose of blood pressure pill, and now you're having hypotension. That's what it looks like to a lot of people. There are a lot of spending in there. You're cutting those taxes. The economy will react to it. And it's not going to be all that positive. And you can't go blaming the Bank of England for this. What's your take on this? Secondly, I think it was last week, Osla van der Leyen was speaking, and she was talking about the fact that they've achieved some level of control over the kind of energy they get from Russia, and they've cut that down to about 10%. How, how, how realistic is that in the, Euro, in the Eurozone now? Because it doesn't look any better. We are still seeing those uh, inflation numbers ticked up by energy prices in Eurozone. And now the IEA is talking about the convergence in terms of energy. Well, the, the, the I, I mean, I, I have my doubts about the IEA. I mean, I, I, you know, it, it's easy for a body like that to, to start scaring people and so on. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure that, that, that that's, that's going to happen. I'm sure there will be debate about it because all these people are politicians who have their own domestic audiences to, 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 to think about. I mean, there's 27 nations. That's, a, that's a, lot of, a lot of people, a lot of nations, a lot of differences, and a lot of different um, ideas about what, what e, the EU use energy policy should be the one thing is that it looks like and again it only looks like it's very very difficult to say because we the, the exact figures are very very difficult to to get hold of but it does look as though um there is more gas storage capacity within europe than previously thought and it looks like some of the hard work that some some of these nations have been doing to to get to get that going um probably is is bearing fruit but like i said i think it's entirely it's entirely wrong to be triumphalistic about this you know whatever happens in the war between ukraine and russia and it it looks like it's got a long way to go and we all know how it's escalating right now uh, it, but what you don't want, you don't want a poor Russia next to you. You don't, you don't, and a rich EU. You don't want poor neighbours. You want to come to some sort of agreement that keeps their people as happy, if we could possibly do that, as um, as as people within the EU. Now, this this sounds a bit Pollyanna-ish. I I do appreciate that, but that. That's really what politicians and what diplomacy is all about right now. Um, as far as the, the, this so-called mini budget here is concerned, I, I was talking earlier on to some people who have experience of, you know, the division between the Treasury or the Finance Ministry, whatever you call it, uh, and also the Bank of England. And, and the, the feeling there is that, you know, there the never has a, never has been conflict between the two. Well, of course there has. I mean, it's been going on for been going on for years. The fact of it is there's a third party involved, which is quasi quiet. And what he's doing is trying to put a rocket underneath civil servants as well, civil servants in the Treasury and saying, what we need to go for is growth because if he doesn't if this doesn't manage to, to to get growth you're absolutely right the whole thing will just cave in um on itself what what he's actually hoping to do and it, it won't happen overnight but he's hoping to get some kind of growth into the economy which itself will be will become part of a virtuous circle which means increased tax revenues and more people wanting to invest in the uk from abroad mark carney the this the long departed 
departed governor of the Bank of England called that the UK has existed for years on the kindness of strangers. And, and I feel there's a lot of that. that the strangers will become more kind if they feel as though this is the place within which one can do business because, you know, large multinational companies are very adept at swapping where they actually pay their taxes. And if they're, if they're getting corporation tax at, at lower rates or they're being subjected to lower rate corporation tax in the UK, that they, they will obviously come here. Okay. <clears throat> Interest rates hikes uh, seem to be very common these days now. Almost every country is raising uh, interest rates, with the exception of Japan, that is maintaining negative uh, interest rates, the only country to do so. But the Bank of England yesterday raised rates by half a, a percentage point, smaller uh, re, uh, interest rate rise than the uh, markets expected. Uh, and the Bank of England is already saying that, well, the UK is already technically in recession. And that by November, after watching what Kwasi Kwateng and Co uh, are planning to do, uh, it may be forced to uh, increase rates further. But can you make sense of this for us, uh, particularly with the effect on mortgage, savings in particular, uh, and then placing that against what uh, Kwasi Kwateng uh, is likely to uh, put on the table today in the emergency budget? which uh, the Times of London this morning is in fact describing as a 50 billion gamble. Is it truly a gamble? Because that's one position. And then Japan, we talked about Japan two days ago. You, we also talked about Japan yesterday. Uh, Japan has now, <clears throat> is taking concrete state action, selling of uh, dollars, trying to prop up uh, the yen. And one of the things uh, Japan has also done is to open up its borders, which is uh, closed for about two years now with uh, you know, domestic travel uh, initiatives uh, to uh, attract uh, tourists. Uh, would that significantly uh, help uh, Japan, uh, where uh, there's very low demand supply, demand side uh, you know, uh, pressures? What, what appears to happen in Japan is that um, families tend to keep literally a lot of yen underneath the mattress in their bedroom. Um, and 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 if if that if, if that's not literal, then it's a metaphor for keeping them keeping yen in in their bank accounts as well. I suspect as, as the interest rate differential and the differential between the value the the perceived value of the yen and the perceived value of the dollar starts to increase. I think that more and more people um, will start to buy dollars domestically uh, because they can easily do it um, on, on their phones now. And and this this I, I saw an estimate the other day of something like four trillion yen um, sitting doing nothing at the moment and that that could be employed by that so what we're seeing is that after years of deflation um, Japan is gradually coming into it, it is and I keep reminding you it is the third largest economy in the world but it, it, it does depend upon imports gradually they're coming into the world gradually is seeing the central bank treating things very very gently indeed it doesn't want to starve off growth that is the last thing that it wants to do but it also has to keep an eye on inflation. I suspect, and I, I'm only looking at the outside figures, I suspect what's happening in, the, in, in Japan is not as serious um, as, as it happens, as it's happening in the United States. You talk about a gamble. Yes, of course it's a gamble. Anything, anything which is changing direction, as much as this, is a gamble. But what, what I, I don't really necessarily think is a gamble is, as I said, I think that international corporate bodies will be looking at where they pay the least amount of corporation tax because that's what they do and that's what their shareholders want them to do. I think if people are freed from higher taxes and start to pay lower taxes, they tend either to save or to spend. And all the indications are in this country that what people do is, that, is actually spend. What socialists don't like doing is allowing people to have freedom what conservatives want to do is to say we will be liberal about this you can actually we will we, we will make the government smaller you can do as you wish it's not social engineering it's just saying what comes naturally which is you take you take possession of, of your own of your own self and your own spending depending on what that may m might be um, as far as mortgages are concerned it does get very very complicated i make no apologies for this in the uk you've got fixed rate mortgages You've also got rare, variable rate mortgages. People who took out mortgages probably a year ago 
one of 10 fixed rate mortgages. So really looking at the mortgage, I mean, you can talk about theoretical increases in, in mortgages and, and house house buying and all the rest of it. Um, what will make a difference is stamp duty. I, I think mortgages, are t the, 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 that, that, that factor is so complicated, it's very, very difficult to make a, a decent sort of judgment about what might happen. But, it, you know, it's, it, it, it is a gamble, um, but it's a change of direction. I mean, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, then we're in trouble. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for your time, Michael. Uh, for business updates across the African continent, Roots do joins us now. Roots, it's great to have you. How are you? I'm fine. Good morning, Rafai. Good morning, Doctor. So just a, a quick thing on Japan. You cannot be cutting interest rates and expecting your currency not to be weak, and also expecting not not, not to try to you know to be trying to um, to intervene with what they're doing right now. It's just it's almost like Turkey. It's very. Um, you know, yeah, it's the Erdogan playbook. Yeah, it's weird. I mean, raise your interest rates and then you will get capital flows coming into your country and then your currency will appreciate. It's 101, so it's very strange. But thank, doctor, thanks for asking that question. Anyway, um, <laughs> to Africa. Um, the headlines coming from Nigeria are pretty much around the Nigeria International um, Economic Partnership Forum going on on the sidelines of the United Nations General Assembly. It was put together by the federal government of Nigeria and the Africa Business Roundtable. Uh, they want to woo investors. And so uh, the um, Attorney General of uh, the Federation, uh, Minister of Justice, uh, Abuka Malami, he was, uh, well, his special advisor was speaking on his behalf was saying that the government is taking steps to stop oil theft. Um, he said that, you know, President Buhari is very concerned about what's going on. They um, are investing a lot in technology for pipeline surveillance. They are boosting, you know, our defense. They are boost. They also they apparently said they even have partnerships with the private security outfits uh, as well. They're signing MOUs with them. He talked about the Petroleum Industry Act as well. So. You know, that's, that's what they're trying to do. Uh, Timmy Pre Silva also uh, was there, uh, Minister of State for Petroleum uh, Resources. Uh, he said, and that's Timmy Pre Silva, uh, said that the government, he, talk, he also talked of the Petroleum Industry Act and said that essentially the Petroleum Industry Act has, for some investors, a 10 year um, tax waiver. You know, that's tried to, you know, um, entice them to invest in the oil and gas sector. In fact, I think we have a quote from him, we paraphrased it a bit. Um, but if we take a look, okay, so we don't, okay, there it is, yeah. So the PIA 2021 has established a legal governance, regulatory, and fiscal framework for the petroleum industry, provides fiscal certainty, improves regulations and incentives for investment, including up to 10 year tax vacations. Now, this um, tax vacations, waivers, and so on, there was a headline, if you take a look at this headline from this day newspaper, it was about a week ago Senate rejects six trillion tax import duty waivers in 2023 proposed budget. Now, Ayot Teriba brought this up. He brought this up at the Lagos Chamber of Commerce Industry chat with Peter Obi. Here's what, you know, this was in our report, but here's what Peter Obi said about tax waivers. All duty waiver, if at all it's gonna happen, must be clearly defined to impact positively on the people. Not for anybody's benefit. So this is the thing. As of course, if you're, you're theoretically, when you offer tax waivers and so on, that's supposed to entice investment. So the revenue that you are losing from offering those tax incentives to those companies is offset by what is going to be earned um, after, or well, pretty much what's the economic benefit of them investing in the in that particular sector in terms of jobs, in terms of you know, then taxes that you would earn after those uh, that period is, is, is has ended. However. I mean, some would say to me, Priscilla, would you want to read the room? Because within the context of, of what he's saying, we have a major revenue crunch, a major revenue issue. And then there's also the oil, oil, the oil, oil theft matter. So whether or not any of this um, entices the investors that they spoke to in New York City, we will see. Nothing was signed. No announcements were made. Um, this is all mm -hmm. just what we got uh, from there. Um, to the creator's economy. Um, YouTube is, YouTube is offering, um, YouTube Shorts, particularly for short videos, is offering creators 45% of advertising revenue. Basically, this is the beauty of competition. Their hand was forced by TikTok, which is owned by ByteDance, which is, of course, a Chinese firm 
Google, YouTube owned by Google, a US firm. Um, TikTok has really been enticing creators. And if, if you think about, think about why anybody's distracted when they're on their phone. Huh? They usually, uh, you can, as, yeah, as, as you can see, like yeah, all yeah, of these watching. Exactly, yeah. as you can see around our studio right now. Um, they're usually watching videos from African creators. It has really boomed. So TikTok has been offering um, revenues to these creators where they can make money. There's a threshold, though. You have to have like a few million views or so on and so forth with your content. It now has forced YouTube to offer you know, offer um, better uh, incentives. Again, see, this is almost, we're talking about incentives again from oil and gas now to creators. So then to bring their platform, to bring their content over to uh, the platform. And then you got, I mean, 45% is, is, is pretty healthy. So if you think just this, this ecosystem, this creative ecosystem, watching it evolve before our very own eyes has been incredible. This all came from Snapchat. We ran initial snap, snaps with the short 30 second videos, um, uh, WhatsApp stole it from anyone. You think about your WhatsApp status, your WhatsApp status, 30 seconds, came from snaps and then Instagram stories and then Facebook stories. You've got, now got YouTube shorts and so on and so forth. So now creators are, are being monetized. Now, but the thing is though, I remember there was a business day headline on a forum that was held about boosting Nigeria's platform economy. Um, TikTok is owned by, you know, it's China. YouTube, of course, is the United States. They're the two biggest economies in the world that have platforms that are monetizing content can we, can we compete there? We go to Ghana. Um, Second Tax um, is a company, a fintech company. Second Tax, which is a secondary trading, uh, secondary trading aggregation exchange. They are, they raised 1.6 million in pre-seed funding for the, a platform that allows Africans to invest in equity markets and um, fixed income debt markets within Africa. Now, let me tie this together. Bamboo is also, they're a Nigerian fintech. Bamboo is going into, um, uh, into uh, Ghana and they're expanding there. So Bamboo offers um, investors in Ghana or individuals in Ghana the ability to invest in U.S. markets. But you're limited to just U.S. markets. What the founders of Sin Second Tax, we come back to Second Tax. Second Tax is saying that, listen, um, Africans do not have the opportunity to invest in other markets. So a Nigerian that wants to invest in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange or wants to invest in the, the, the EGX30 in Egypt, those opportunities are not there. So they are saying, and the founder of um, Second Tax is a former Goldman Sachs guy who's a consultant and a techer. So this is, mm. this is very, very interesting. Now, so to where, and if you think about Nigeria and Ghana, two um, currencies that have been very pummeled, yeah. you know, the opportunity to invest in other markets is something that these platforms are, are giving them a chance. I, to I, I, mean, I mean, great stories you had today, but let me talk about the waivers then. I talk about YouTube. So I'll talk about the waivers first. Waivers are given because you see an end in sight. You don't just dash it like you're some fat at Christmas. And I think that's what we're dashing. Mm. And I was happy when the Senate said, let's look into the six trillion waiver. Right. Because you're giving out waivers in more than what is subsidy. I mean, are you kidding me for a budget? So add the two of them together. Yeah. Add the six so trillion. If, if you had given six trillion waivers, <laughs> subsidy six trillion, that's like 12, 12 trillion. trillion. What, that, what, that's what, the entire. That is the entire budget deficit for next year. For next if year. The, so if the what, what, I, what are, are you saying? Over. And I'm happy that at least the Senate cracked it down for once. Yeah. Because you only give waivers to incentivize people. So the person that's trying to go give 10 years, I said there's 10 years tax waiver in PIA. I'm like, are you kidding me? With this regulatory framework, there you was have, no model, though. There was no, no economic model, model to model and, and that's who the is coming in. I have with all of this kind plan, of right. You know, when you are giving an economic suggestion on idea, Model it around something. And show us the model. Give me the range. Don't just say, oh, you're going to give 10 years tax waiver. How much is it going to bring back to the Nigerian economy? Don't guess. At a time Don't where guess to fossil me. fuel investments are it, on the downtrend. And, and you're tanking and you're telling uh, yeah. me, yes, it's to incentivize people, but also show us a model around it so that it doesn't just be very nebulous. And the problem with all this incentive from government is that it's very nebulous. It only goes to their friends and it's not far reaching. In the end, it doesn't make the scratch on the economy. You talked about platform economy. Platform economy is a big deal. And if Nigeria, if we're wise in this country, we should tap into it. It's, it's not happenstance that YouTube became the very best. Mm. It's not happenstance that uh, TikTok is rearing to with China. Also, I'll correlate that with intellectual property. Yeah, important Look point. at China. Mm. Look at YouTube. Look at China. Look at America. They have about the biggest libraries in the world. Yep. They have about, you know, good universities. China is just coming up the ranking. You need intellectual property. But I see possibility also in Nigeria. Yeah. 
And I'm going to call out a very dear online friend of mine, yeah. Sheung Okua. Ah, Oshewa. Oshewa of... Um, Sheung, what are you doing with Naira Land? Naira Land, yeah. Sheung, you can make Naira Land compete with all these big boys. Do something with their company. I'm going to tag Sheung. Go commercial. Float it. Sheung, Sheung. watching. Sheung, uh, <laughs> Sheung, we just sell funding and just live on the platform like that. Mm. I think Sean gets one of the biggest websites hit in this country. Oh, of course. Nairland is huge. Nairland is about the biggest yeah, and yeah. it's been consistent. For years. For, just imagine. 20 years? How just imagine Nairland you Nairland? giving Sean 20 million US and say Sean play with 20 million US. There's so much you can do on Nairland. Right. And that's what we should be looking at. Because you see the likes of the uh, YouTubes of the world, the TikToks of the world, they got funding. Right. Exactly. So if you inject funding, we can have platform capital that could reach across Africa. So, my dear Sheung Oshewa, I'm calling you out today. I'm throwing you the challenge. Do something. <laughs> <coughs> okay, let me talk about the statements by the Attorney General of the Federation in New York yeah. and also by the uh, Minister of State for Petroleum, uh, Chief Timmy mm. Okay, we have to understand the context. This was in New York mm. as an event organized by the Nigerian delegation yeah. on the sidelines of the main event. <clears throat> which is the United Nations General Assembly. Yeah. And what are they trying, looking for? Money. Economic partnership. Yeah. That's the word they use. And on both sides, they have one responsibility, to sell Nigeria to the international community, yeah. to seek partnerships for Nigeria. I mean, no matter what anybody says, until the last moment, persons occupying positions in government, they will keep trying. Mm. So, and you don't expect that if they go outside, to an international forum like the United Nations, they will go there and demarket Nigeria. Right. So both Malami and uh, Siva, they were marketing their country. So at the level of principle, that's fine. Mm. The second thing to note is that if you now interrogate the content of what both men said, you could have issues with it. Yeah. For example, one of the things that the Attorney General was selling was a public-private sector partnership with regard to securing the pipelines. And he said Nigeria is uh, engaging uh, private security office. Mm. In other words, he was talking about Tumpolo right. and uh, uh, pipeline surveillance. But there are many Nigerians who have issues with that. Indeed. In fact, that has even been ethnicized. But you don't expect him to tell the international community that. Yeah. He talked you about, you don't know? He, he talked about <laughs> the NMPC yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, uh, using technology mm. to track crude oil theft right. uh, and uh, applying a certain uh, application, you know, uh, a technological application. Where is that application? I was just in the control room. Which is control room? <laughs> No, no. We, had, we, had a, we had a report. There's a control room. Well, he also, talked, they, they, he also <laughs> talked about the PIA, yeah, yeah. the framework, the suppression of piracy and other matters, the supermarket yeah. of 2019. That's just regular talk. Right. And if you look at the uh, Minister of Petroleum, or State for Petroleum, too, he was talking about gas expansion program in Nigeria. Who is uh, benefiting from that gas expansion uh, program. So yeah. this is the kind of marketing things that you just see right. in front of the international community. You want investment. But the main reason many of these investors left Nigeria was because of the contradictions within the country. And right. even with the PIA in place, because one of them was saying, we're following the timelines of the PIA very well. Which timelines? This same PIA talks about subsidy removal. Exactly. We shifted the, the timelines. Right. But as you said, you know, talking to economic intelligence people in an international uh, 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 system, mm. uh, forum, they have their own ways of double-checking on <laughs> this. No. Yeah. But it's good to market uh, the country, yeah. because that's their job. Yes. <laughs> now, as to uh, the example of uh, Bamboo, right? Bamboo, Bamboo cash, yes. And the uh, Nigerian uh, FinTech yeah. that is going to Ghana. Good news. So much innovation, creativity, achievement in the FinTech, uh, with the FinTech startups. Yeah. Okay, the good thing about Bamboo now is that, and other fintechs, is that they are bringing that uh, opportunity closer to ordinary people. Yeah. You don't have to be so rich, right. you know, to invest. With $10, you can mm. invest in stocks and they help you out and all that. However, Bamboo uh, Cash going to Ghana should learn from the example of Flutterwave. Mm, indeed. Flutterwave, you know, had big problems in uh, Kenya, mm. where, in fact, uh, the court has ruled twice now, freezing their accounts. Mm. First, it was about... 10, 10 billion dollars, 10 billion dollars, right? No, uh, million. Was it, no, it was in was the it millions. Was it 10 million dollars? It was in the millions, yeah. And then the there million. was a 3.3 3 
million dollars. Yeah. And then the Kenyan Asset Recovery Agency is even at this moment uh, investigating Flutter, which is a big fintech startup, you know, in the whole of Africa. Maybe there are lessons mm. that the Bamboo Cash guys can learn uh, from the experience of a uh, flutter wave. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed, so, indeed. Thank you very much. Thank Charles. you, Doctor. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take a short break now. And when we return, we'll be talking to Uma Asani, former senior special assistant on media and publicity, to former vice president Namadi Sambo of Nigeria. Stay with us. We'll be right back. <laughs>